Welcome to today's virtual presentation hosted by the Whitman College Alumni Office. My name is Nancy Mitchell and I serve as the Director of Alumni Relations for the college. And before we start, I just want to explain the format for today's program. After my introduction, Pam Walton will uh, give remarks for about 15 minutes. Then we will view The Lodge, the film she has produced. The film runs about 35 minutes. And then at the conclusion of the film, we will come back for a Q&A session and Jennifer Northam, class of 91 and Associate Director of Alumni Relations will facilitate the Q&A. You can uh, put your questions in the chat or the um, Q&A tool. And I just wanted to alert you that um, this program is being recorded. And in about a week, you should find the recording on our alumni uh, virtual page. For those of you who, uh, for those of us who work in the alumni office, one of the best things about our work is the opportunity to meet alumni who have gone on to do such amazing things. And each year, the Alumni Association Board of Directors recognize five of those individuals for their outstanding commitments to communities, careers, or Whitman College. Today, it gives me great pleasure to recognize Pam Walton, class of 66, as the recipient of the 2021 Sally Rogers Award for Lifelong Achievement. This award was created in 1999 to honor Sally Rogers, a longtime director of alumni relation, and it is given to an individual who graduated from Whitman over 50 years ago and whose life exemplifies the qualities of a liberal arts education. An award-winning documentarian, Pam is dedicated to telling the truth about American life. Her films have chronicled LGBTQIA plus lives, politics, and culture, working to change our culture's homophobic views of gay and lesbian people, and more recently, focusing on ageism. Her work has screened at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, and the Margaret Mead Film Festival and has been included in the prestigious International Public Television Screening Conference input. Walton has two master's degrees from Stanford University, one in education and the other in communication, um, in particular film and video production. She was a lecturer in communication at Stanford from 1989 to 1999. Although she only attended Whitman from 1962 to 1964, when she returned to campus for her 50th reunion, she noted, quote, that time has stood as two of the most important years of my life, unquote. Mm -hmm. The reason for Walton's selection for this award can be found in the motto of her Bemonious Production Company for her work in, quote, illuminating gay and lesbian lives and the journeys of extraordinary older women, unquote. It gives me great pleasure to recognize Pam Walton, class of 66, and uh, the certificate reads, and of course, because we couldn't do this in person, um, we ship Pam's um, lovely award, and it reads, filmmaker, chronicler, illuminator for showcasing the lives of LGBTQ people from adolescence to retirement and beyond, for striving to change long held prejudices through can candid, honest storytelling, for focusing on fighting against cultural homophobia and ageism. We present you with the 2021 Sally Rogers Award for Lifelong Achievement. Congratulations, Pam, we're so thrilled. Thank you. <laughs> and with that, uh, we will turn the program over to you. Great. Can you see me now? Yes. Okay, good. I am just absolutely thrilled to be here. I can, you know, in fact, I can't find words for it really, but I'm going to find them and tell you all about why this award means so much to me. Um, Nancy's already told you that I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my life and a couple of my films, just to give you uh, really the reason why I am blown away by this award. Um, so I'd like to um, start out by saying something to you that I was never able to say at Whitman College 
in 1964. And it's very important for me to say this every time I come back to Whitman, <laughs> it's one of the most healing feelings uh, that I experience when I say this. I want you all to know that all of my most important and emotional and sexual relationships have been with other women. And in 1964, when I was a sophomore at Whitman, I could not have said that. Uh, uh, I kept all of that a secret to myself. And um, I wanna show you the first slide. Are you ready, Jennifer? Here I am in 1964. And I, some of you have probably seen this slide. If you looked at the promotion for this uh, presentation, uh, this is me. I was 17 or 18 years old, uh, sophomore at Whitman. I'm in the Y lat poo in this picture. And, uh, you know, I just realized how cute she was. <laughs> Poor on thing. I never realized how cute she was. Look at her. She's got great hair. I can't remember how I did my hair, but she's got this bubble hairdo, pearls. All the women in my sorority, Alpha Chi Omega, had pearls on that day with a black sweater. And the smile, there she is. And you would never guess from looking at this picture of me in 1964 that it was one of the most suicidal years of my life. And we can come back to me now, Jennifer, if you will. Okay. Okay. Uh, it didn't help when I was at Whitman that the Dean of Women at the time gathered all of the freshman women together in Anderson Hall in the lounge and gave us an orientation about how to adapt to college life and what to expect at Whitman and you know the orientation thing. It didn't help that during that orientation, she warned us all about the evils of lesbianism. And uh, I saw everybody in the room nodding <laughs> and I nodded and I began to think, uh-oh, what's gonna happen with my life? I was born in 1944 and my generation, if, of my generation, if you were white, heterosexual and privileged, <laughs> the expected standard was for you to go to college, meet someone, get married, and then have a life. So here I was in Anderson Hall, uh, as a freshman anyway, um, seeing my friends, uh, beginning to date boys, going to fraternity parties. I did some of that myself. Some of my friends even talking about falling in love and getting married. And all the while, I was um, falling in love with the woman down the hall. <laughs> and I really, I thought I was the only girl at Whitman that I felt this way. And uh, I used to go stand by the bridge over Mill Creek that runs behind Anderson. And I used to think about dying. I thought, well, how can I lead my evil life? What will I do? Maybe a way out is dying. Of course, I was 18 and probably being overdramatic, but still it was there. And I decided to leave Whitman and I went to a, the University of California at Riverside thinking things would be better. I guess I thought things would be better. They weren't better. In 1964, most colleges and universities in this country did not recognize their gay and lesbian students. There were no support groups for them. There were no clubs or groups at all, no support in any way. And uh, when I left the University of California at Riverside, I went to Stanford and got my teaching degree. 
and I stepped off into being a high school teacher. <laughs> and uh, for a high for 20 years, I was a high school teacher. And, um, you know, I think back about that time and I think I was a good teacher, but I could have been such a better teacher if I had been all there. Half of me was buried because my students, fellow faculty, I wasn't out to them. My sexual orientation was hidden. And if you're from California, you probably remember that um, there was the Briggs Initiative during that time. And uh, if it had been passed into law, it would have made it a crime for homosexual teachers to teach in the public schools. So it was not a brilliant time to be out as a lesbian, especially if you were teaching. And you know, by the time I had been there for 20 years, I was really ready to give up being in the closet. So I <clears throat> applied to Stanford's graduate film program. They have a master's in film program and I resigned from teaching. Now I'm telling you all this just to give you a flavor uh, of where I was in, by now it's 1985, 85, 1985, okay? Some of this must seem sort of old fashioned to a lot of you, but it was my life and it was the life of a lot of lesbians in this time. And I went to uh, Stanford and I had to submit an idea for a thesis film. I'm not, I can't tell if I'm really looking at you or not. I guess I am, okay. <laughs> I had to submit an idea for a thesis film. And I remember the moment I was walking across the oval. Have you ever been to Stanford, that big oval that runs right in front of the quad? I was walking across that oval and it was like a beam of light hit me, boing. I am going to make my thesis film about lesbians. <laughs> and in 1985 at Stanford in their film program, believe it or not, not many films had been made about gay people. Not many documentaries had been made about gay and lesbian people. All right, so 1985, I wish that I could see you all and hear what you're thinking and doing and stuff because I want you to go back to 1985 for a bit, uh, if you can, and think what were the stereotypes? Uh, what were the common, I guess, myths, images that people had about lesbians in 1985? Since they didn't seem to exist anywhere, they weren't teaching in school, they weren't in college, you know, what were the myths about them? Now I can't hear what you're saying or thinking, so I've come up with my own. How about this? Lonely. Lesbians were lonely people because they didn't have healthy relationships for one thing. Lonely, unattractive, because if they were attractive, surely a man would have married them. This is 1985. Um, how about closeted? That kind of goes without saying. And then of course, the extreme would probably be, whoops, my phone is ringing. The extreme would probably be, uh, sorry, I didn't expect this to happen. Um, Hypermasculine, you know what I mean? Leather dykes with whips and chains and motorcycles. All right, there are the images. So these, images did not line up with my experience. Now I want you to know that mine is just one experience. There are a lot of ways to talk about, write about, make films about gay and lesbian people. And my way is just my perspective. And these uh, stereotypes did not line up with my perspective. I decided I was going to come out and I was gonna drag all of my friends out with me. Oh, mamma mia. <laughs> um, 
uh, and we all lived in the suburbs. So they, uh, I was gonna make a film about lesbians in the suburbs. Well, there aren't any lesbians in the suburbs. That's not part of the mythology. So um, I made this film, I called it Out in Suburbia. And uh, next slide, Jennifer. <laughs> well, here are two of them. <laughs> this is Marilyn and Marie. They'd been together for about 20 years. Uh, Marilyn was a travel agent. Other lesbians in the film, in the film were doctors, uh, social workers, um, teachers, lawyers. Uh, the next slide. This is my friend Joyce Fulton. I taught with her for 20 years. Joyce and I were teachers at Woodside High School in the 1980s. So I figured this film was going to do something for making these lesbians visible. That seems to be a big theme, making, making people ideas visible uh, helps dispel a lot of the stereotypes. So we can leave Joyce and come back to me. And um, I'm looking at my notes so I don't leave anything out. We made Out in Suburbia and we intended it for uh, educational distribution. We wanted it to reach colleges and uh, universities and even high schools. We thought maybe high schools would be interested in uh, out in suburbia. And uh, we even visited some classrooms in colleges and showed the film to the class and then did comments after, uh, afterwards. And I asked them to write comments and I saved a lot of these comments. I have a folder full of them, but the one I remember <laughs> that stands out in my mind is shocking. These women look like normal people. <laughs> so we knew we had achieved our goal. Um, we showed um, Out in Suburbia on PBS. We did a simulcast between WNET and uh, KQED in San Francisco. And I have to tell you, some of the women in New York were very unhappy with Out in Suburbia. It was way too white and suburban for them. And they wanted to see more of the uh, leather dykes and radicals. But of course, in 30 minutes, we could only make one film about lesbians in suburbia. And we thought we did a pretty good job. Okay, so now I'm moving on with my film life and I'm not gonna talk about all my films, but I do wanna talk a little bit about gay youth because it parallels my experiences growing up. It's 1989 now, the dates are important. And in 1989, we read the report on youth suicide and it was commissioned during the Reagan administration of all things because of a big jump in youth suicide between 1950 and 1980. Uh, youth is defined in the uh, report as ages between 15 and 24. Why were people in this age group killing themselves more and more often than they should be. So we got the report and we read the third volume of it. The third part of it was gay male and lesbian youth suicide. And we found out three very tragic statistics. We found out that one third of all gay and lesbian youth are more likely, I guess I'm not saying it quite right, three times Gay and lesbian youth are three times as likely to abuse drugs and alcohol than heterosexual youth in that category. Uh, one of the other statistics was that one fourth of all youth under the age of 18 living on the streets are gay and lesbian youth. Now remember this is 1989, hopefully it's changed since then. But living on the streets, of course, was, an, was an, um, um, a kind way of saying 
got kicked out of their families because their parents didn't know what to do with them. And the last statistic was the most horrifying that fully one third of all youth suicides committed in the United States each year was by gay and lesbian youth. And in 1989, we didn't say gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and asexual plus youth. We just said gay and lesbian youth. So it didn't even take in the whole number of young people. All right, so that was enough for me. We decided to make this film. And of course we did research and fundraising and we went into several high schools. Um, and 24 years after my college experience, this is what we heard from uh, high school administrators. Oh no, we don't have gay students here. Oh no, the silence, the pall of silence around this issue was still pretty heavy duty. And I know you can think now things have gotten so much better. Um, let me show you a few of our gay youth in this film. You wanna do the next slide, Jennifer? This is Jason. Jason was 22 years old when he was agreed to be interviewed for gay youth. And he was out and feeling pretty comfortable about himself even in 1989. Actually, the film was produced and released in 1992. Next is a Simeon. Simeon had a lot of trouble uh, coming out and even considered taking a bunch of sedatives that his mother had in her ca uh, medical cabinet, but he didn't, thank God. And next is Chris. Chris, uh, somebody said to me when they saw gay youth for the first time, why would you put someone like Chris in your movie? Chris is a magnificent human being. Uh, he came out to his mother. She was horrified. She put him on a plane and said, get lost. He came to San Francisco and started living in a shelter. And Chris is now a happy adult living uh, in North Carolina, but he had a great story to tell. Next is Tony. Tony went to Stanford. Tony was a freshman at Stanford in 1989. And her mother was very uh, supportive of her choices, her sexual orientation. And next is Gina. We told gay youth uh, in two deep stories, two in-depth stories. One was about Gina, whose family was very supportive. Next slide. Here's Gina with her mother and father and brother. They were very supportive of her um, being an out lesbian in high school. And the other story that we told was about Bobby Griffith. And I didn't include his picture. I must have just forgotten to do that. Bobby killed himself when he was 22. Mm. His mother convinced him that he was going straight to hell if he didn't change. So he didn't get out of that terrible hole. Okay, uh, we can come back to me. Well, I am really happy to, to update you. I'm sure I don't need to update you if you tuned into this. Um, presentation, you know that it's so much better for gay and lesbian uh, people uh, right now. High schools have gay straight alliances. Uh, Stanford has a huge gay straight alliance. Whitman College has PRISM, which stands for Pride, Raising Involvement, Solidarity and Mentorship. And it meets every Wednesday at 4.30 in Grover Alston Center. <laughs> I just read that on the internet. I hope it's still true. If I had had that group, wow, my life could have started so much sooner. And, you know, it's my hope that my work has contributed to some of the change. There's been a lot of powerful change uh, in the, um, 
2000s, we were able to get married. Wow, that was a big one. And um, uh, so I'm not really going to uh, say too much more about my other films. Next slide is about Family Values, a film that we made about my um, biological family. Um, this is an interesting slide because it's a, uh, a greeting card that my father had made uh, in 1964 when he was um, writing speeches for Barry Goldwater, who was running for president then. My father was very involved with the religious right and family values. And he had this picture taken of us. That's me on the far right. That dress I wore at Whitman College, <laughs> that was the summer before I went to the UC Riverside. Uh, my father never knew I was a lesbian until much later. He would not have approved if he had known I was standing there right next to him as a lesbian. Uh, so we made a film about family values. What are real family values? And the next film we made, next slide, is uh, about a lesbian family that we felt showed more um, family values than my biological family had shown. And these, these films, all the ones I've mentioned to you, you can find on uh, Vimeo. You can go, want to come back to me now, Jennifer? Uh, if you go to my website and go to any of my film pages, you'll be directed to a Vimeo link that will take you to the film itself and you can take a look at any of them and I hope you will. I love having an audience. And um, finally, the um, issue that we got most involved with kind of veered away from gay and lesbian issues and it got into aging. Want to show the next slide? We decided, uh, especially since we were getting old, that we wanted to make a film about old women. And we found the perfect group, the raging grannies. <laughs> These women are not your mother's grandmothers. They are amazing. I was turning 60 when we made Raging Grannies. Want to change the slide, Jennifer? Uh, and I was worried about getting old after I met the grannies and made this film, I was no longer worried about getting old. They range in age from 55 to 90 something, and they get out in the street regularly to protest injustice wherever they find it. They've been on, uh, believe it or not, Fox News. They've been in the San Jose Mercury News. They've been in the local news here in the Bay Area. Um, and they're still going strong, last I checked. And then the next slide is a film we made about women artists, older women artists, three women, a painter, a writer, and a ceramic artist, all in their 70s, all still kicking, all still making art. And then this last film, the last film that we made, this one that I wanna show you right now, is um, back to LGBTQ issues. And it's about LGBTQ retirement. Believe it or not, when you talk to people who run retirement communities, they will tell you most of the time, we don't have gay people <laughs> in our communities. You can go back to me now, Jennifer. Sad but true, again, we're invisible. So our last film is prompting um, folks to recognize seniors. And um, I'm gonna let you just look at the film, it'll speak for itself. And then afterwards, Jennifer will bring us back and we'll um, do a little Q and A or talking or whatever you wanna do. If you I think go to- her. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much, Pam. If you go to the chat box down at the bottom of your screen, the link to the film is there. There is no password required right now. 
And what I'm going to do is mute everyone so we have a chance to switch to that screen and watch the film. And when the credits roll, we invite you to come back. Let me get things started. I'd like to uh, introduce Ruth Carranza. Did I say that right? Hi, and uh, Ruth is uh, Pam's wife and co-producer and uh, has her own filmography and uh, we can absolutely talk about that if you'd like. Um, but uh, she's here to help with the Q&A as we talk about uh, this film and uh, any others. So, great. The option, um, for you to submit questions is either to add them to the chat function at the bottom, or you can uh, raise your hand and turn on your camera. Let me know that you have a question and I will ask you to unmute so that you can ask it. Um, you can, uh, in the reaction section, raise your hand and I will absolutely um, have that same opportunity to unmute you or however you'd like to share your question. <laughs> and I'm going to take you up. I don't know if you uh, do this as a Zoom participant, but put on speaker view so you can see who's speaking. I'm going to gallery view so I can see everyone and see who has uh, any questions for Pam. Here we have one in the chat from uh, Lee, uh, Lynn Greenboro, Green, sorry, Greenow. I'm trying to read on my little screen, it's not going well. What has become easier for you and what has become more difficult over the years when making films? Oh, <laughs> well, what do you think, Ruth? For your film? Um, yeah, Ruth makes a different kind of film. So I'll just talk about mine. Okay. Uh, it was, uh, in the very beginning, it was hard to raise money for the films. It's always money that's a problem in it, with an independent film. And um, uh, we got small amounts of money here and there. The most exciting amount of money that we ever got was for gay youth. Uh, a man in uh, New Mexico sent us a check for $10,000 because he had had a pretty bad youth and he wanted to contribute uh, to this film. And, you know, the world of documentary filmmaking has changed so much since we started making films in 1988. Uh, you know, documentaries are very popular now. You can find them on Netflix, and Amazon and all over the place. And um, those big budget documentaries are the ones that get the biggest audiences. So we uh, have sought an educational audience for most of our films. Um, I guess the fundraising has been the most difficult. What would you say, Ruth? Hmm. I think from my perspective, because I did technical films on, uh, electrical engineering, manufacturing, and it was getting into, getting into industry, letting them allow us to come in with a crew and actually film. So um, it got easier. It was hard at first to convince them that, uh, you know, that it would be good for them and it would, you know, and it was good all for education. And there's nothing, you know, especially when you're talking about electrical engineering, there's nothing like seeing it happen than to having professors on the bulletin board, you know, writing or doing the animation. I mean, I could look at that and say, I know I could do animation that would explain that better. So that was, I think, the hardest uh, to, to get start. But once we got into Intel or one of the big companies, then other companies would come in. So the more I got, the better it got. And it was all fun. Hard work, but fun. And, you know, rewarding. 
Uh, we have a question from Danielle Garvey Reeser, who is the, she's from class of 97. What surprised you or did you learn from hearing the stories of the residents at the lodge? Let's see. Uh, let's see, I'm not sure that anything really surprised me or us. I think um, it was pretty uh, eye-opening uh, to talk to people like Sue Pierce, who showed us her ice cream, and to realize that Sue had been in the closet her whole life, and that this was the first place that she had been able to be herself. And the same for Bill Bryant, uh, who was a public school teacher who felt so good about being here that he could put on pink and dance around in the living room. <laughs> and he said that when he got here, he was, he became more himself. And you know that, I don't know if you can appreciate that or not. I just am reminded of a quote from uh, Campbell, what's his name? <laughs> anyway, it is the privilege of a lifetime to be who you are. It seems like such a simple thing, but so horrible if you can't be who you are. Joseph Campbell. And I have to say that with Bill Bart, another time I've heard him say when he's talked to other people that when he got here, he sat down and just cried. So. Thank you for that. <laughs> Molly. All right. I just uh, had a little thing on that. Um, I just watched a wonderful documentary about Oliver Sacks and he wrote his memoirs like the year be before he died or and that that's when he came out to everybody to the world basically and i was just like oh so heart-wrenching <laughs> and like, to not be able to be all himself his whole life <laughs> and he was such a just an amazing guy <laughs> yeah well you know what's interesting is uh ruth and i live here <clears throat> at fountain grove lodge so we had access to the people that we are that are in the film. <clears throat> but a good friend of ours who lives in Palo Alto, Palo Alto, you would think would be a pretty progressive place. Uh, she's been a friend of ours for years and years. She just decided to retire to a community in Palo Alto and she's gone back into the closet because she isn't comfortable being herself in this particular retirement community. And I think that's one of the things we hoped would, this film would accomplish, that um, people who run retirement communities should make allowances for some of their residents being gay and lesbian instead of forcing them back into the closet. or asking them. Mm -hmm. Intimidating. <laughs> Sorry, this is from Winston. Do you know if residents, well, you would know as residents yourselves, but are you required to sign something or a vow somehow that you are pro LGBTQ or an ally to live there, something like that? Whoever comes here, it knows what they're getting into. Any, any of the non-gay folks, they know what they're getting into because it's part of marketing. That's a whole deal that they do here is that they market to it. So anybody that comes in, they know. And we have the gay flag up along with the US flag. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, and it's been comfortable. <laughs> a lot of, <clears throat> A few people have, have expressed the feeling that, oh, this, this should be an all gay place. That's how it was originally marketed. And it didn't fill up 
So they opened it up to allies, people who wanted to come here and who were open to living with and around gay and lesbian people. But you know what? I am so glad that our allies are here. I think this place would be unbearable if it was all gay. <laughs> it's just really wonderful to have gay, yes, <laughs> gay straights together. That's lovely, that's lovely. Uh, how do you think the resident demographics of the lodge will look in the coming years? Do you think the 50-50 split will be maintained? I hope so. I think it will. Right now, uh, they're interviewing several uh, gay couples, men and women, uh, who want to come live here. And the ratio shifts. Uh, sometimes it's a little more gay than straight and a little more straight than gay. But it mostly it turns out to be about 50-50. But, you know, I think um, it's a concern for a lot of people who live here that, um, you know, this retirement business is a big business. And if the people who sell, who run and own this place decide to sell it, what will happen to Fountain Grove Lodge? Will it continue to be welcoming gay people? Uh, you know, so that's always kind of a thought in the background. Kind of along that lines, do you have a sense for how facilities like this, either mostly gay, lesbian, or mixed, are on the increase elsewhere in the United States? Do you know of others that are actively and openly recruiting gay residents? Uh, I had heard a decade or so ago of a primarily gay group residents in the Portland area, but haven't heard of it since and don't know whether it had survived. Mm -hmm. Well, we most of the gay and lesbian retirement places that have started up over the last 10 years haven't gotten very far. There was the one in New Mexico I know of, and also Florida and North Carolina. Uh, I think what's making Fountain Grove Lodge succeed is that it was created by a developer um, who built the place and had the money to put into it to hold it up until it got going. Uh, and some of the other places didn't have that. Um, I uh, know some friends of ours are thinking about a retirement place in Bend, Oregon. And they just went up and investigated it and asked if there were any gay and lesbian people at, at this particular retirement place. And um, the answer was, well, we had a lesbian couple but they left. So, you know, it's, it's going to happen, but it's just like everything else. It takes a while. I think it's a generational thing, don't you? Uh, the next generation won't have so much trouble with this. And I'll say the generation that follows me, so my children are so inclusive and welcoming and accepting. I just, they and their friends are absolutely welcoming of, of everyone, no matter what, and have what seems to be a much more accepting um, attitude towards fluidity. Yes. Which is yes. just fascinating to me to watch. Yeah, and, me and, and amazing and wonderful. Uh -huh. uh, just wonderful. So uh, following up on the, um, the founders of this, uh, of the lodge, who, who were the Gallagher's? Did they have gay family or friends or was it just a good financial idea? Mm -hmm. Well, let's see, we know about some research that was done before the lodge was built. Um, and we know that Cindy and Bill Gallagher uh, have a multiracial family. They've adopted several kids. And they could see from their uh, experience with building retirement communities that something like Fountain Grove Lodge was needed, that it was really a social justice issue, that gay and lesbian people should feel welcomed at, at retirement communities. So they built one for them. And, um, you know, the Gallagher's are under fire for a lot of things. The news, local newspapers always criticizing them. Uh, but 
they did a very good thing by building this lodge and I'm grateful for it. Molly, did I see your hand up again? Oh, you. <laughs> I've got all these ideas going around in my head. Um, so my husband's mother was a lesbian and uh, she's, she, she died about eight years, nine years ago, I guess. That's why I say was. Um, and, you know, for the whole time I knew her, um, she was, um, she was married to a man and had an affair with a man. And then when she got divorced. She, you know, this woman that she worked with, uh, you know, kind of encouraged her, like, this might be the thing for you basically. And, and she said, oh, okay. And it was obviously very foreign to her, but, um, anyways, they were together on and off, I think for about 35 years. Hmm. And um, so I live in Eugene, Oregon. They used to live in California and my husband encouraged them to move up to Eugene, which I looked up and I've heard that Eugene is one of those havens for LGBTQ people, oh. which, which it, you know, I, I am, I've, I've got a, you know, I, when we moved into this house, we had a gay couple living across the street. We've got a lesbian couple who lives catty corner from us. It's like, yeah, no big deal. <laughs> um, but they, um, my mother-in-law and her partner, I know they lived in a, like a 50, 55 and over community for a while. And her partner used to call it the compound. <laughs> I kind of wonder if maybe they didn't feel very welcome there. I, you know, or if anybody even knew, I, I'm not really sure about that. They finally left and moved into a house actually across the street from the 55 and over community. And then my mother-in-law, um, she had all developed Alzheimer's and um, lived in a memory care center not far from us. And as far as I knew, they were, they knew she was a lesbian and it was fine. <laughs> so that was, that was good to know. <laughs> the world is changing. Yes, a lot. <laughs> I, I grew up in the 80s, by the way, when I didn't even know what gay meant. I, well, I went to a Catholic school from like 1979 to 1984. <laughs> so, of course, it wasn't talked about there. Yeah. And I remember uh, reading a book and it was, talk, you know, the book was talking about somebody was gay and I didn't know what it meant. And I asked my mom and she explained it to me and I was like, huh, okay. <laughs> and you know, but to, like I said, Catholic high school, didn't then know anybody who was gay or lesbian, uh, Whitman College, kind of, I knew a couple guys that I was pretty sure were gay, but I wasn't aware of any women that I knew who were lesbians. Since then, gotten back on Facebook and talked to, you know, gotten back in touch with a lot of my friends, you know, one of my best friends from high school, she's a lesbian she actually came and told me and my friends and it was like oh okay you know <laughs> and uh my um several other high school people also another friend and I was like oh yeah and then one of my roommates from Whitman turned out you know she didn't know it then but she she told me she was a lesbian and it's like oh that's fine <laughs> so yeah it's where it has changed a lot <laughs> Yes. Well, it really has changed at Whitman. I've been back a few times. And uh, one of the young women who showed me around the campus was, uh, I think she described herself as questioning. Mm -hmm. I like the fluidity mm -hmm. that a lot of young people are coming to. She hadn't decided exactly who she was, which is great. Who knows at 18? <laughs> Okay, I've got a couple more here in the chat and then one that came in via text. You started your filmmaking career during the Reagan administration at the beginning of what finally became obvious was the AIDS epidemic. Do you feel like there's more of a presence of lesbians as a result of that crisis, that, that absolute health epidemic that happened during your lifetime. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
I know that it's no secret that lesbian communities came together to help gay men through the AIDS epidemic. Our friends in New York City lost almost all their friends to AIDS in the mid to late 80s. Um, we were lucky enough, I was lucky enough, some of my closest friends, male gay friends, managed to avoid AIDS. So I just felt like we were really lucky. Can you comment on the healthcare system and the understand, understanding or lack thereof among providers who otherwise specialize in treating older adults? Does this present a challenge despite the very accommodating staff of the lodge? Hmm. Let's see, I'm not sure I understand the question. Is it written out here? Uh -huh. but, uh, can you comment on the healthcare system and understanding among providers who otherwise specialize in treatment? Uh, I think the question is about, are we as older adults well cared for here? I don't think it's about here. I think in general. It's, I think it's hard to speak about in general. As far as here, at least they're aware, they are aware, you know, our med techs and that, you know, they are aware. And I think they would, you know, speak to the healthcare where patients do go to or the residents go to, would keep an eye on that. Right. I think we're set up for assisted living, independent and assisted living. And one of our good friends who's living here who has just recently turned 88, uh, needs assistance. So she pays a little bit more every month and she gets special attention from the medical technicians. And it, the aides here are very tuned in to older people and their needs. And um, it's possible when you uh, begin to need it, when you begin to realize that you're not able to care for yourself, to go down the driveway here to the terraces, which is our memory care unit. And you can be taken care of there. I think that's... Uh, I, think, I think there has been, uh, as residents, um, there have been some residents that have tried to address specifically issues that might be healthcare related to gay and lesbians. Um, or uh, men and women, and um, but that you know that didn't go to <laughs> that wasn't too popular perhaps because you know if you're not if you're not particularly ill or things like that you know it's like maybe you don't even want to think about it. <laughs> I don't know it didn't go they, they were trying to do this as part of the wellness committee and. Um, it didn't, it wasn't the most engaging of the topics that people got involved in. Chris, did that answer a question for you? Well, thanks. Yes. Thanks, yeah, that, that's good. And uh, I was interest, interested in how the local provide, the professional provider community adapted to the needs of having same-sex um, partners and, 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 and understanding the, just being able to have the conversation yep. with, with the providers outside of, and I should have said outside of, outside of the residents. Yeah, well, Kaiser is just down the road uh, and many, many, many residents here are members of Kaiser. Ruth and I have a doctor who knows that we're a lesbian couple. And it's, you know, fairly easy to be out to our doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope everybody can be out to his or her doctor. <laughs> I... Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it, isn't, it, it isn't that easy everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but you know that. Yes. <laughs> and it is easier for us because we come, we go to 
see the doctors and we're from FGL. So they know we are gay and lesbian. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's become very comfortable. And I think it's because we're used to being here. You go out in that world and they know they're from, we're from here. So there's an understanding, a basic understanding. At That's least. great. That's a great selling point. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And they want our business <laughs> and they have a lot of residents. They have a lot of patients that are the residents here. So they're already been dealing with it and they're open to it. So. Another question from the chat from Dan Ross. Are there any transgender residents and are they accepted in the community? Excellent question. I've wondered, there are no transgender people here. But, but oh, wait a minute though. <laughs> okay. I don't think there are any transgender <laughs> people here. I would love it if some transgender people would come to the lodge. I think and they I think they would be welcome. They have been here. Oh. But they have been family members. Um, oh, not residents. Of the residents. Oh. Family members of the residents. We have one uh, resident uh, that I know of that has grandkids that are transgendering. And, you know, but it's not something they want to put up pressure, you know. Uh, you know the kids or the parents, they don't want them to go through this whole thing with, so they, they, they don't talk about it. But we know, but they tell us, you know, so we know. Yeah, you know, this group of people here, mm -hmm. thank God, oh, I hope we don't offend anyone. Most of them are not Republican. Oh. So we, <laughs> so we have a pretty, awake group of people. And we're always wanting to learn, <laughs> learn more <laughs> about everything. And so there have been uh, presentations about transgender. Uh, movies. We've yes, and we movies. also have movies going on all the time about different things, so. All right, I don't see, oh, oh, here comes Molly. <laughs> Hola. Hola. <laughs> I, I couldn't remember the name of this, but I remember this one particular kind of short story film. Um, it was on HBO and it was called If These Walls Could Talk. Uh -huh. And the second season of it, the one I, I, I realized that all three stories were about lesbians at different ages, but the first one was set in 1961. And there was a, le a lesbian couple who lived in this house. And the one, the woman who technically owned the house fell off a ladder and yeah. died. Yeah. Oh, and yes. and she, the, her partner made it look like, you know, they weren't a couple and all this. Mm -hmm. And then because, you know, her partner owned the house, her family came in and took all the stuff and like, oh, it's too bad. You can't live here anymore. Um, I mean, she was just like, what? <laughs> it was just <laughs> heartbreaking. Yes. That it was just yeah. kick her out like that because they had no clue what the relationship was every, and just thought they were roommates. And every Wednesday here uh, in the theater, they show it's Wednesdays is gay movies. So we've seen that one and we've <laughs> seen <laughs> several. But uh, yeah. So. Uh, also, I meant to mention that another one of my lifelong achievements is marrying Ruth. We got married in 2008. That has made a huge difference in the way uh, people relate to us. It isn't the same as being, uh, what is it, partners, uh, you know, uh, yeah. domestic, partners. domestic partners. partners. Right. It's not the same. Uh, Ruth's family, Ruth comes from a large a Latino family and they understand marriage. Yeah. They couldn't understand domestic partners. <laughs> they didn't even want to understand it. Yeah. They didn't want to look at it. Uh -huh. you know, somehow we were nothing. And yeah. So now we're married, which takes care of a lot of that legal yeah. problem. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, this was, oh, this was back in 2000 when it wasn't legal obviously and 
it's just yeah i'm so glad that that you all could be married now yeah me too another question from the chat are you submitting your film to lgbtq film festivals yeah so i'm so glad you asked about this uh we have been uh accepted into several gay and lesbian film festivals uh palm springs atlanta uh let's see uh philadelphia pittsburgh uh we've also gotten into some straight film festivals louisville toronto um and what we're really hoping for is uh some acceptance in to NETA, NETA, the National Educational Television Association. They uh, take films and then make them available to PBS stations all over the country. And then, you know, your local PBS station can see, oh, the lodge. Let's see what that's like. Oh, we'll put that on the air next month. That would be wonderful because we will always want an audience. Uh, a wide audience for the work we do. Festivals are great, but they're especially weird now, you know, because they're not in person anymore, uh, or mostly not in person. They're all streamed on computers. You have to pay $7 to watch a film on your computer. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, a little different. Going back to Christopher's question about um, healthcare, and uh, there was a reply from Cindy that uh, she has worked at a children's hospital, and over the last 10 years, there's been tremendous work in developing sensitivity to gay teens mm -hmm. and the best approach mm -hmm. to care for them. Mm -hmm. Right, that's great. And I was looking through my papers here. I've got it written, but of course I can't find it now. Things have gotten so much better for gay youth. <clears throat> but it's good to remember that as of 2016, the Centers for Disease Control have still determined that gay and lesbian youth are four times as likely to commit suicide or to at least consider suicide as heterosexual youth. And that still, as young people begin to realize that they're gay or lesbian or questioning or bisexual, still the best way for them to deal with it or the most common way for them to deal with it is to hide. So, you know, we're getting there. Uh, Zoe commented uh, and asked if you think, do you think the fact that festivals are streamed actually helps to increase access and audience. And I, I'll, I'll preface that by saying uh, we have found that as we were shoved into the pandemic and could not do in-person events, our uh, launching of a virtual program for alumni, which this event is a, is a part of it, um, we were able to reach far more people, uh, people who had never come to events, people who were able to attend, um, who don't live in areas that we travel mm -hmm. to present alumni programming. Mm -hmm. Do you find that? Have you heard from uh, viewers that perhaps you would not have had the opportunity to hear from? Early in the yeah, course. it's a little early, early for us to tell with the lodge, but I certainly hope so. I think Zoom is here to stay. I think it's involved a lot more people uh, with streaming material and discussions like this. I hope lots of people go to these streaming festivals and see the lodge. That would be wonderful. Well, I think there is time for one more question, but it's a big one. <laughs> uh, at this point in your life, what would your advice be to gay youth? Oh, that's a hard one. You know, uh, I learned in the making of gay youth and subsequently, it's not always a good idea to come out right away. 
uh, it's better to find support groups or supporting adults than to just come say uh, right out to your parents, especially if you think they might not be accepting. Chris, one of the peop young people in our film, came out to his mother and she got a plane ticket to leave, to go somewhere. So yeah, that's a very important thing to consider. Um, but I think, you know, from visiting Whitman and from uh, staying in touch with my high school friends who are still teaching high school, uh, there's so much more support. The important thing is to find support before you come out, yeah. I think. Um, I also know that I learned in for my own life that, and in making gay youth, that one caring adult can make a huge difference in a young person's life. And I think that's where I think teachers could be very helpful because sometimes, you know, even though we're more, we, you know, things have changed. There's still a lot of people, and I don't mean to, again, you know, religion has, has its limits. And if you're in a, I know my family was very religious. And, you know, it's not something I could have ever. And that's why being married was so important to me because there's still that family love, but to be ignored, um, you know, it's uh, being married was the only way I could, my family would have to look at me and say, all right, you're married, you know. Um, but yeah, and I think finding support, if your parents aren't open to it, then find support elsewhere. Well, that's a hard one. I see there's a question here mm -hmm. about, from a high school teacher, one of her students attempted suicide a couple of years ago. And she lives with her grandparents who aren't very accepting. Right. <laughs> you don't want to come out if it's mm -hmm. not safe. Well, oh gosh. You know, PFLAG, Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, um, a supported adult. Uh, you, you, the teacher, put your arms around her. Uh, one caring adult can make such a huge difference. Can change your life. Thank you so much, uh, Pam and Ruth, for taking time to uh, share your thoughts and answer these questions, and especially sharing your film and uh, really the, the breadth of your career um, as a filmmaker. It's been a delight to speak with you. And I know uh, we had a good group. To, yes, uh, very to good. Also... And I thank you guys all. Oh, oh, I'm oh, so Ruth. proud of her. She's my <laughs> number one fan. I'm so proud of her. But I hope you can all appreciate why this Sally Rogers Lifelong Achievement Award is so important to me coming from Whitman. It's one of my treasures now. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that we were able to do this. Yeah. Well, us too. Thank you so much. And Whitman is just as proud of you, Pam. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you everyone for okay. joining us tonight. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. You too. Bye-bye.